God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We bless God for this moment in time where we can come and give you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's all about the saving of souls. It's not about um, anything more than that at this time. What's most important is for you to be in the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, your careers are not important. Your, uh, your goals to do things in this life is not important. Uh, the greatest importance of all is having the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and entering in the kingdom of God. If you don't enter the kingdom of God, your whole life has been in vain. When death comes, and it can come at any time, death ticks all ages. Death is no respect of person. So it doesn't matter how young, how old you are, death could come suddenly upon you. But death, amen, has, praise God, no toll upon those that have given their life to Jesus. Death becomes a, uh, a transport from this life into the presence of God for the believer, for those that have given their life to Jesus. But for those that have not given their life to Jesus, death is a terror to you because you're going to end up in a place of torment, which we call hell in the Bible. Amen. A place where you'll be tormented both day and night for not making a choice to follow Jesus. Amen. That's, that's the consequence. Amen. So that's, at this point, that is the thing that should be considered more than anything is being in the kingdom of God. Amen. So again, we do bring you greetings in the most holy name of Jesus Christ from the church of uh, chosen generation, church of Jesus Christ. Amen. We also want to encourage you that's listening. Amen. To uh, subscribe if you have not already. Amen. Subscribe. In your uh, subscribing, you are supporting the ministry and the work of God. Amen. And you're being a blessing to the work that God has given us to do. Amen. So I want to encourage you in that and continue, amen, to tell others about, amen, this, amen, service that's being rendered this hour, this day. Uh, so let's turn, amen, swiftly into the, to the word of God. We're going to look at um, Thessalonians, the uh, fourth chapter, uh, the fourth chapter. And today our message is looking at, we're basically looking at the first stage of his coming. There's the first stage and there's a second stage. We'll probably get into that as well for this time. If not, we're just going to deal with the first stage of his coming. Amen. The first stage of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, involves the church. It doesn't involve the world. The first stage of his coming is centered around the church. And we're going to look at that. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians, 4th chapter, 16th verse. Read. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Underline two, two words here, clouds and air. We're going to meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air. When we look at clouds, we're looking at the troposphere. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. He's going to leave the intangible and come to the tangible realm. He's going to leave the natural realm and come, or the spiritual realm, rather, and come to the natural realm. To leave heaven, heaven is the intangible. Heaven, praise God, uh, is... is uh, you're looking at a, uh, a physical, uh, not a physical, but you're looking at a spiritual realm. When you look at God's heaven. When you look at what we consider heaven in the natural sense, it becomes the physical realm. So the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. Amen. So... Our gathering together unto him is the first stage of his coming. This is all centered around the church. It's where the Lord will meet the believers. He's going to meet them in the clouds. And he's going to meet them in the air. 
praise God. Notice he's not going to meet them in the earth. When we say clouds, we're looking at the troposphere in the physical realm. The clouds consist of the troposphere. Amen. Uh, he's going to meet us in our upper atmosphere. He's going to meet us in the clouds. That's our atmosphere. That's our, looking at our, our upper atmosphere. In the air. Didn't say in the earth. Because the first stage of his coming involves meeting his children in the air. This is where we, at that moment, will defeat gravity. We will ascend. Praise God. Into the heavens or into heaven. Heaven as in the troposphere. Into the clouds. In the air. Praise God. I had a uh, dream long ago. Uh, I believe it had to, I believe it took place in the, uh, yeah, it took place in the 80s as I can think back. I gave my life to the Lord and uh, entered into the kingdom of God in the 80s, in the early 80s. Amen. Uh, specifically in, in 82. Uh, God was giving me visions upon visions, but it, it so happened to be he gave me a dream that was straight from him. I was in this dream. I was walking down the street, and all of a sudden I ascended. Praise God. I went up, praise God, into the clouds. When I went up, I was traveling so fast that I could hear the wind whistling in my ears. Uh, I didn't know I was dreaming. I thought I was being uh, raptured or caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I mean, it was just that real to me. I, 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 I was just so astonished when I woke up and it was a dream. And in fact, I laid back down to try to get back to the dream again. I wanted to relive that. <laughs> so I'm like, Lord, take me back to that dream because the joy I felt as I was being caught up to meet the Lord. But what I noticed was I was traveling so fast that I could hear the wind whistling in my ears. And as I was going up, I kept saying, it's over. It's over. I couldn't believe it, it ended that quick. That God it was taking the church out of the earth so quickly. Amen. It caught me off guard because I was just walking, praise God, uh, blessing God in my heart, praise God, just walking down the street, amen, not even knowing, praise God, that that was the hour of the church to be taken out in this dream. Praise God. So when I went up, praise God, I went up uh, so quickly and so fast. Amen. And, and, and the speed that I was traveling in caused my uh, caused the wind rather to whistle in my ears as I was going up. Praise God. And I was one of the uh, blessed dreams, one of the best dreams I ever had from God. And when I woke up, I was disappointed. It was a dream. Praise God. Hallelujah. I say, Lord, this, I wanted to be, uh, uh, after that, I was like, Lord, take me now, praise God. You don't have to wait. I was like, John, and when Jesus said, behold, I come quickly, I said, come even so. Come, Lord Jesus. Take me now, praise God. There's nothing in this life worth staying down here for, but God let me know he had a purpose for me, praise God. He didn't want me just to be raptured up after salvation, but God wanted to bring others into the kingdom of God, so he left me here, praise God, that others may come to know him. Praise God. And after that, God used me to bring other people into the kingdom of God. Amen. And I began to see my purpose that, uh, you know, it's not about me. It's about the saving of souls. It's about people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I went back to my mission, praise God. But I truly was heartbroken because that was such a thrill, praise God, that I wanted to relive that again and again. And again, but just to give you an idea, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord. This is the first stage. The first stage of his coming involves the church solely. Not the world, but the church. This is where we read about there was one, uh, uh, there one, one will be ticking and the other left. We're talking about uh, the catching away of the saints. Uh, one will be, uh, two will be in the field. The one will be ticking. And the other left. Two would be in the bed. The one would be ticking. And the, well, we can understand why that's the case because one gave their life to Jesus and one didn't. Praise God. You could be on the job with people that don't care nothing about Jesus. They're going to be left. But the one that gave their life to Jesus will be ticking 
and caught away to meet the Lord in the clouds in the air. Praise God. So that's the first stage of his coming. And there's other uh, uh, scriptures we can look at about the first stage of his coming. But we just want you to see that uh, there's two stages of his coming. Now, the Bible spends a lot of time talking about that second stage, which involves the world. The second stage is a dreadful time for the world. Because the Lord is coming back to punish them. To rain wrath upon them. Praise God. Amen. So we'll probably come back next week to look at both uh, the first and, and the second stage. So we're just going to give you an, an introduction today. Amen. Let's let's go uh, let's go fit, go back to that verse again. Read that verse one more time. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. For the believer, these are words of comfort. That God's going to take us, praise God, home with him. Praise God. We're going to live with Jesus for eternity. Those words are words of comfort. To the believer. Though the world cares nothing about these scriptures. Those, the world is those that have chosen not to follow Jesus. God make a distinction between the believer and the unbeliever. The believer is called the church. And the unbeliever is called the world in biblical terms. So when we say the world, we're not talking about like this masses of people. As people would define the word world. But amen, we're talking about the unbeliever. Praise God. When the Bible used the word world. A lot of times is in reference to the unbelievers. And, and we know that God refers to us as the church. For we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're right here with unbelievers, but we're not unbelievers. Praise God. We're not of this world. Praise God. We don't think like those that have made a decision not to follow Jesus. Our thinking is totally different. The church I mean, of the, of, the, of, the, of the living God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our attention is Christ-centered. Everything is about Jesus for us. Everything. Not just one thing. Everything. Praise God. And our music is all about Jesus. And the things we do, our activities, is all about Jesus. Praise God. Everything is Jesus for us. Amen. Everything. So when we look at it, the church is a division between the church and and the unbelievers. The unbelievers being reviewed as it being uh, referenced as the world in the Bible. Amen. But there's a day for the unbelievers where we look at the second stage of his coming. So let's uh, consider that when it talks about the catching away, the first stage, that the catching away of the believers, the saints. And the word saint comes from the word sanctified, means set apart. Those whom God has set apart for himself. Praise God. Those whom God has preserved for himself. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll be with him one day. Hallelujah. The people of God. It will come a time in the first stage that the world will go on without us. We will be on the missing list. It'd be like in the days of Enoch when God took Enoch out of the earth. The Bible say uh, he could not be found for God had taken him. So there was a search and there will be a search again for those whom God has set aside for himself, which is the believer. When God took us out of the earth, what's going to happen is people are going to wonder where they're at. There's going to be a disappearance. Because when God takes us, it's going to be a mystery because though we go up, amen, they're not going to really, praise God, know what happened. All they know is that we miss them. You go to see grandma and grandma ain't there no more, praise God. 
Let's go to grandma's house. Grandma done went on to be with the Lord. Amen. And you you still clueless. You say, we got to find grandma. Grandma's not missing. She's with Jesus. Praise God. Oh, we got to find mama. Mama ain't missing. Mama has been caught up, praise God, to meet Jesus in the air. And people are going to be clueless. Praise God. Looking for folk that have gone on to be with the Lord. There's going to be a search. But they shall not be found, praise God. For God had taken them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's going to be a search. Praise God. And folk are going to be looking. Because unbelievers just can't believe. Even after, after the church is taken out, they're going to still be in their unbelief. They, they're going to be in doubt of that. They're, they're going to equate it to something else. Who knows? The news media may come on and say uh, thousands of people are missing around the world. It's a phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon. It's that you guys will probably not be able to accept what Jesus has done. Praise God. That's the first stage. That's the first stage. Somebody's going to be left behind. Somebody's going to be taken to be with the Lord. Who's going to be left behind? Those who did not put the Lord, amen, first and allowed him to be in their lives. Children have to understand this. Adults have to understand this. If you don't want Jesus, then Jesus ain't going to force himself on you. Your mother or your father, children, cannot force Jesus in your life. Because he stands at the door and he knocks. He doesn't knock the door down. He doesn't come in and tick you by force. If Jesus is in anybody's life, it's by choice. He only saved those who wants to be saved. If you don't have a desire to be saved, he ain't coming for you. He ain't going to force you to do nothing. He'll let you be the devil you want to be because without Jesus, you're going to be a devil. And you are a devil right now. If you don't have Jesus, you're just a big devil. And you're a little, you could be a little devil too. If Jesus is not in your life from little to large to medium, whatever your size may be, you're a devil. Because Jesus is not there. The only way for you to be have any pureness and holiness about you is that Jesus is in your life. If he's not there, we know you're born of the devil. Very simple. But, but as we read, that, that was the last verse, I believe. We read, is that the last verse we just read? Let's go into the fifth chapter. Now, the fifth chapter goes into another stage. Still talking about the coming of the Lord. No, I, want you, I want you to see the contrast between the two. In the fourth chapter, it talks about meeting the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. Comfort one another with these words, because it's a joyful event. The first stage is described as a joyful event. Because we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with him. That's a joyful event for the believer. That's a joyful event. And as David said, in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what we're going to experience. Fullness of joy. And pleasures forevermore in the presence of God. Hallelujah. That's the first stage. The first stage consists of joy, but not the second stage. Praise God. We're going to read about the second stage of his coming, which, which involves the unbeliever. How God's going to deal with the unbeliever. Go ahead. But the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord... Uh, hold up. Underline something here. When we read the fourth chapter, we don't see the term, the day of the Lord, dear, if you notice. Read the whole fourth chapter when you get a chance. It's talking about the first stage of his coming. and doesn't use the term, the day of the Lord. I want you to understand, whenever you see in the Bible, the day day of the Lord, you're talking about wrath and judgment. We're going to go to the Old Testament and see the same term used, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. So we're going to another stage of his coming. Read that verse again. 
for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief. Now watch, this is a coming too, but it's a coming for judgment. The day of the Lord come as a thief. I want you to understand, it's not a thief to the believer. The first stage is not talking about God coming as a thief because a thief is someone you don't suspect. We are taught to be waiting and watching. The believer is taught to be waiting and watching. And for those that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin under salvation. So it's no surprise because we're looking, praise God, looking for that blessed hope. But when it comes to the world, it's a big surprise. My God, it's a surprise. It's a big surprise. It's like a thief coming in the night. You didn't expect your house to be broken into, but the thief have come. If you knew the thief was coming, you would prepare yourself. But see, the thing of it is, God comes to the world as a thief in the night. Praise God. Go ahead. Keep reading. For when they shall say peace. Now watch. Watch the difference. When they. This is not the church. When they shall say the world. When they shall say peace. Because he's coming to the world. As a thief. To the unbeliever. To you that don't believe. Amen. In the message of Jesus Christ. He's coming to you as a thief. Now we'll find. When we look at the Bible. There's more said about the second stage of the coming than the first. And because there's more said about it, a lot of people get confused between the two. But the first stage, the world has nothing to do with when we meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with him. The world has nothing to do with that, the unbeliever. But the world has a whole lot to do with this day of the Lord. For we know when the day of the Lord comes, it comes as a thief. And when they say that they is those that are unbelievers, when they say peace, watch out. Watch out. Because they're saying we're doing good without them. See, their peace is, is living their own life independent of God. Living like the devil, sinning as much as they desire to sin and, and not even thinking there's going to be any accountability for their actions. That's their peace. Oh, we got away clean as far as they're concerned. We living, living any way we want to live, doing what we're big enough to do and don't have to answer to nobody. But here comes the surprise. Praise God, the one that you denied all your life shows up as a thief. The one that you refuse to allow him to reign and to live in your life. You refuse to give your life to Jesus. You continue to do things that was not pleasing to God. He has showed up as a thief. And when you say it's all good, you say it's peace now. Because you're happy in your sins. Then he comes, praise God. He comes. When they shall say, pick it up from there. When they shall say what? For when they shall say peace and safety, Good. then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Watch this. The coming of the Lord for the unbeliever is sudden destruction. It's not a, it's not a happy event for them. It's not a happy event for them. The day of the Lord. As described for how God, the day of the Lord describes a day of wrath and, and revenge. God taking vengeance upon those that denied him the right as a creator to reign over his creation. And so here come Jesus. My God, my God. Here come Jesus. And you got to deal with all of that. Here come Jesus. Here come Jesus. And when they should say uh, peace and safety, what happens after that? Read that, pick it up from there. When they should say peace and safety. 
Then sudden destruction comes upon them. Then sudden destruction. Because we're not dealing with the church. The church will not be destroyed. But the unbeliever will. That's why you got to know the difference between the coming. You got to know the difference between what stage you're looking at. Because this doesn't describe how God would deal with the believer. But with the unbeliever. Then sudden destruction will come upon them. Pick it up from there. As travail upon a woman with child. A woman doesn't know when labor pains are coming. But my God, they, when, the, when the pains come, is something that you know is beyond anything she can bear. The anguish and pain that she will feel is a description of the anguish and pain the unbeliever will experience when Jesus returns. When Jesus returns. So when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as a woman travailing in pain. Pick it up from there. And they shall not escape. And they're not going to get away. See, this is the second stage of his coming. And they shall not escape. God's going to, he's going to come and bring destruction upon them. And they shall not escape. Let's go to the, uh, the book of Revelations 1 and 7. This is describing the second stage of his coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him. Now watch this. This is not the first stage. This is not where it's talking to the believer. But this is directed towards the unbeliever. The second stage. Where he's dealing with the unbeliever. That's why we, we, we take the coming of the Lord and break it down to stages. The first stage is solely in reference to him dealing with the church. Where he takes the church out of the earth. So when the church is being taken out of the earth, that's the first stage. But the second stage is when he brings judgment and wrath upon the ungodly. Keep reading. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. They should do what? Wail. It, it's not a joyful event. They shall wail because of him. See, this is not talking to the believer because the believer will rejoice at the coming of the Lord. But the sinner will wail because of him. Because he knows he's going to get it. He knows that God is going to put something on him and he's going to have to deal with his consequences of his sins. Amen. He thought he was getting away with and now he has to face those consequences. And they should wear, oh no, here it come. We wasn't expecting this, praise God. We thought we could do what we were big enough to do. We thought when the preacher preached and we decided not to give our life to Jesus, that, that we had to worry about nothing. But here come Jesus to bring judgment upon the ungodly. And they're going to well, well because of him. Because they know what's coming. All the families of the earth. All the kindreds of the earth. They're going to wail because of him. Because they know that this is not a joyful event for them because they're unbelievers. They're unbelievers. Ready to bring it to a close. Let's go to uh, Amos, the fifth chapter of Amos. And that's uh, the fifth chapter of Amos, verses 18 through 20. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? Now notice this. Again, the term, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of wrath. Why would you want the day of the Lord? See, when you choose not to follow Jesus, you're basically desiring the day of the Lord. 
You desire to be punished. Why would you desire that? Why would you not give your life to Jesus? Are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? Do you know what's coming upon the earth? Why would you not bow your knees before, amen, the one that made you and brought you into existence? Why would you not bow your knees before the judge of the whole earth? Who everybody had to give an answer to. There will be a judgment day and the judge is Jesus. Why would you not serve him? Why would you wait until judgment come upon you? Why would you desire the day of the Lord? Why would you desire that? Are you spiritually insane? What is going on with you? Preachers are preaching day and night and you're still living in your sins. Do you know that God is going to cause you to give account for all the deeds you've done in your body? Are you waiting for that to happen? Why would you desire that day when you can escape it just by giving your life to Jesus? Why would you desire? Woe unto them that desire the day of the Lord. For what good is it to you? Read that again. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? What do you got to look forward to? You that want to live in your sins, you desire the day of the Lord. To what end, to what, praise God, benefit is it to you? Keep reading. The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Because the wrath of God is going to fall. So it's darkness and not light. My God, go ahead. And if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and laid his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even very dark and no brightness in it. So understand when you heard the term the day of the Lord. That you're talking about that stage of his coming. Where judgment will be poured upon the ungodly. It's not something to look forward to. Keep reading. I hate. I now, despise your feast days. Okay we stop there. Now if we look at the idea God is giving. Let the unbeliever know that you don't want to wait for this one. You don't want to try me because you don't want to deal with what I'm bringing. Praise God. Let's, let's turn to, we're going to end it in, in Psalms. Uh, Division of Psalms 148, start at verse 6. Division 148, verse 6. He hath also established them forever and ever. Now, it's Psalms 148. We got the right one? Maybe I put you on the wrong page. Uh, keep reading. Keep reading. Maybe I... Go ahead. It's probably, I probably got the right verse. Go ahead. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons in all deeps. Fire now, and now hell... I got, now I got the wrong verse. And I got the wrong division. Let's, let's go. I think it must be 49. Try 49 and 6. One forty nine verse six. Try that. Let the high praises of God be in their that's mouth. That's it. That's it. That's it. So now here's the thing. We we're going to show you. We're, again, we we're looking at the day of the Lord, and we want you to know what it consists of. Gave you. We went, we're in the Old Testament to give you a little uh, highlight on what the term when we look at the day of the Lord and how it, how we can describe it. Here, it's going to describe it to us as well. Go ahead. Read that verse again. Start again. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Now watch this. See, God's going to involve also in judgment his people in executing this judgment. See, not only is you going to have to deal with the Lord himself, you're also going to have to deal with the believer. Because God's going to put it in our hand, in our power, to bring judgment upon you. The Bible said, know you not, to, to, talking to the believer, that you shall judge the world. You're going to punish the world. You're going to judge angels and, 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 and principalities. You will be a part of the army of the Lord that's bringing judgment and wrath. 
Jude described it this way. He said, Behold, the Lord cometh with, uh, uh, with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. So we're not just, praise God, amen, uh, uh, just ticking away to be with the Lord, but we're going to come back in that second stage of his coming. We will play a role in administering wrath and judgment. The believer. So we come with a two-edged sword in our hand, praise God. Read that, read that verse again where it talks about the two-edged sword. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen. So the heathen is representing the nations that have not bowed their knees to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming to execute judgment upon you. The Lord himself is bringing judgment, but he will allow us also to minister judgment with him against the nations. Go ahead. And punishments upon the people. We're going to punish the nations that have not given their life to Jesus. Go ahead. To bind their kings with chains. And watch this. This is what we're going to do. We're going to bind your kings, your, your, your leaders with chains. Go ahead. And their nobles with fetters of iron. Yes. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. And watch this. The word of God is telling you it's an honor that God has given us to be a part of bringing judgment upon those that have not bowed their knees to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to bind you with chains. Praise God. This is the honor given. Read that verse again. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise all the, the saints, Lord. all of those that, that chose to follow Jesus Christ have their honor in bringing judgment on the ungodly. He said all of his saints. How many? All. All of those that chose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, this honor is given to you. You're going to play a role in it. You're going to play a role in the judgment that shall fall. In the judgment that shall fall. If we go to the book of Jude, it talks about, it, it mentions the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Now, when he say 10,000, it's not an actual number to, in the biblical sense, he's using the numeral uh, in his day and time. Like you could say millions in our day and time. You could say even trillions or zillions because our number is greater now than it was back then when when Enoch was living, Enoch is the one that prophesied this. Uh, his number system wasn't as high as ours. So it's like saying millions are un some number, but this gives you a great number in his time. He said ten thousands. Right. But that way, that's where his mathematics were at that time. But we can say zillions, trillions, meaning a number we can't even number. But then the psalmist give it to us more specifically. He say, all of his saints. We can just say all and leave it there. That we will execute judgment. In fact, let's close in the book of Jude so you can see that. And we're going we're gonna to move on. Uh, and read, read the, uh, Jude. There's only one chapter of Jude, the 14th verse. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. Talking about is it a descendant, the seventh from Adam. Uh, could be referring to maybe the seventh generation of Adam. But he's the seventh from Adam. Now Jude, the, I mean uh, Jude is pointing out to Enoch rather. Enoch being the seventh from Adam. Uh, it's beautiful that he reveals to us that Enoch prophesied. He's the one, the first example we get in the Bible of the catching away of the saints. For he was the first one that never tasted of death. God took him out of the earth. And they were searching for him and could not find him. Then this one prophesied. And, and, and this is what, what blesses me is that God uses him to prophesy about the judgment that will fall upon the ungodly. Read that verse 14 again. And Enoch also, the seven from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints 
to execute judgment upon all. Now watch this. So he comes, but not alone. He comes with his saints. As the psalmist said, it's the honor is given to us. This is the honor he's given us to bring judgment upon the ungodly. So he comes with the saints. And what happens with that? When he comes with all of his saints. To execute judgment upon all. To execute judgment. So if we look at it, to execute judgment upon all, go ahead. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, mm -hmm. which they have ungodly committed. And all and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now watch this. People think they're big and bad when they speak against the message of Christ. But you're going to have to pay for that. People blaspheme, blaspheme God so freely, not knowing there's consequences for that. And Jude explains, and we're closing here, we're done. Jude explains that we are coming with the Lord to bring about the judgment upon the earth. That is the amazing thing. We're coming back to bring about judgment. Amen. So the first stage of his coming involves taking us out of the earth where we meet him in the air. Talking about this, the believer. Solely for the believer, the first stage. Second stage is where he judges the world. Where he punish the nations that have denied him. And then in closing, we find out that we play a role in executing the judgment Upon the nations. Not just the Lord himself. The Lord himself definitely will bring the destruction. But we will be working with him. In bringing destruction. Upon those that have denied the Lord Jesus Christ. This honor have he given to all his saints. Psalms 149. We thank God for his word. Repent. And be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.